Uh, thank you, Irina, uh, for the invitation. Thank you, everybody, for coming here. It really is a joy to be in conferences again in person and to meet everybody, to chat with people, and especially to be back here in Tallinn and the, now today the Ava Pert Centre. So the topic of the conference is um, on being human. And as Irina mentioned, I spent a lot of time in the early church reflecting or examining, researching what it is to be a human being. I'd say, in fact, that perhaps the writings of the early Christians have some of the most provocative statements regarding what it is to be human. For instance, while being marched under guard from Antioch to Rome to be martyred in Rome, Ignatius of Antioch wrote a letter to the Roman Christians urging them that whatever they do, they shouldn't interfere with this coming martyrdom. He wrote to them, he said, Birth pangs are upon me. Allow me, my brethren. Hinder me not from living. Do not wish me to die. Allow me to receive the pure light. When I will have arrived there, I will be a human being. Allow me to follow the example of the passion of my God. So he's not yet born, he's not yet living, and he's not yet human. He sees his impending martyrdom as an opportunity to be conformed to Christ and his passion, and in that way be born into life as a human being. Irina mentioned a book I'd written a few years ago on the Gospel of John. I argue in part of that book that the background for this kind of idea is in the Gospel of John and the play that it makes with Genesis. So the Gospel of John and Genesis both open with the same words, in the beginning. Yet Christ's final word on the cross in the Gospel of John, it is finished, completed, perfected, plays upon the switch in the mood of the verbs used in Genesis 1. Think about Genesis 1. God speaks everything into existence. Let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be. It is, it's good, next day. Then after making heaven and earth with this let it be, he then switches from the imperative to the subjunctive. Let us make a human being in our image after our likeness. So he set the stage, as it were, by saying, let it be for all the rest of creation. And then he deliberates and announces his own particular project, the particular work of God. And this project is what is finally completed on Calvary, as is shown unwittingly by Pilate in the Gospel of John, when before he sends him to be crucified, Pilate says, behold the human being. So the Sabbath during which Christ is in the tomb is, according to the Gospel of John, the great Sabbath, when God finally rests, his work is now complete in Christ who gave the let it be to that work. If we follow the main lines of Christian theological reflection thereafter, especially the Chalcedonian definition, we have the one Jesus Christ as proclaimed by the apostles in accordance with scripture, He's not simply what it is to be God and what it is to be human, as if we're defining what it is to be God apart from him and defining what it is to be human apart from him and then trying to put the both together. Rather, he defines what it is to be God and what it is to be human. And he does so together in one, one hypostasis, one prosopon. And he does so by laying down his life in love for others. He shows us what it is to be God in the way that he dies as a human being, so also showing us what it is to be human, so that Ignatius can hope to become human by following Christ in this way. If you think about it, we have all come into existence without any choice, as Kirillov in Dostoevsky's Demons protests, no one asked me if I wanted to be born. We think we've got freedom, but we had no choice about it. And we've been thrown into existence without any choice, into an existence in which whatever we do, we're going to die. We are mortal from the beginning. But the cross of Christ invites us to turn that mortality inside out so that it becomes the path for changing the ground of our existence 
From necessity and mortality, which is how we came into existence, no choice, and I'm going to die. Changing the ground of our existence from necessity and mortality into freedom and self-offering love. A voluntary birth, as Ignatius puts it, into life, as Ignatius puts it, because we don't have life, we're as good as dead from the beginning. A birth into life as a human being. So if that is what it is to be human, to live by voluntarily laying down your life in self-offering love for another, then actually it gets even more perplexing because that is not something that God could have commanded into existence with a divine imperative. He couldn't say, let there be a human being. It's something that we have to say, let it be, in order to be voluntary self-offering love. We are the ones who have to give the let it be to the only work that's said to be God's own work. Moreover, if Christ shows us what it is to be God in this way, then we are also invited to realize our high calling. In the words of the psalm quoted by Christ, I say you are gods, but you will die like human beings. The two things go together. Now one can find those kind of ideas expressed throughout early Christianity, and I've spent a lot of the last years writing, teaching, talking about all of that. As Christian theology developed in the fourth century, we, be, we can begin to see these ideas taken further. And one of the most interesting works in this respect is a work by Gregory of Nyssa. It used to be called in English, On the Making of Man, the Latin title De Harmonis Opificio, but in fact the real title of the work is On the Human Image of God. Within the next few months, I'll have a new critical edition, translation, and introduction coming out of that work on the human image of God. And that's what I'm going to share with you, what I found in that work about what it is to be human. Because he takes everything I've said and takes it further in really mind-blowing ways. It was written between the death of his brother Basil, September 378, and sent to his brother Peter as an Easter gift in 379. It was ostensibly written to complete Basil's hexameron. Basil, before he died, wrote a work on the six days of creation, and he never quite got to the human being. Gregory says, I'm going to write this work to complete that. But in fact, Gregory does so much more. What Gregory does is to rework Plato's Timaeus. Now, Plato's Timaeus was the most important work in the ancient world regarding cosmology and the place of the human being within it. It provided a comprehensive cosmology and anthropology, and Gregory drew upon that and shaped his, his own work, patterning that, as we'll see, and also drawing upon all sorts of works from Anaxagoras, the pre-Socratic philosopher, Philo, Origen, many others. And then he inspired, with this work, he inspired a whole load of later figures like Maximus the Confessor in the East and Eriugena in the West. I'm going to have to start just briefly with Plato's Timaeus, just to show you some structural points with regard to it. So Plato's Timaeus, in the dialogue Plato's Timaeus, the character Timaeus gives a long speech describing the creation of the world and the human being. It's a long speech covering over actually more than one dialogue. And that speech has got three parts. In the first part, he describes the world in terms of its divine order, brought into being the best of, by the best of all makers who wish to impart the best of all things to his creation. But then halfway through the speech, he then stops himself. And he says, now in all but a brief part of the discourse I've just completed, I have presented what has been crafted by the intellect. But I need to match this account by providing a comparable one concerning the things that have come about by necessity. Anangi, the same word that was spoken about um, yesterday. He says, for this ordered world is of mixed birth. It's the offspring of a union of necessity and intellect. Intellect prevailed over necessity by persuading it. And then a little bit later on he talks about the necessities also being the straying cause. 
Okay? So then he goes through the second part of the, of the discourse, talking about necessity of the straying cause and our intellects prevailing over it. And then finally, he gets to the last part of his dialogue, and he says, so we've now sorted out the different kinds of cause which lie ready before us like lumber for carpenters. From them, we are to weave together the remainder of our account. So let's return briefly to our starting point quickly proceed to the same place from which we arrived at our present position. Let us try to put a final head on our account. So he's given two accounts, one according to intellect, the divine craftsmanship, one according to necessity, the straying cause, and how intellect has to persuade necessity. And then he says, we've got to put them together under a single head and give a final account. Now, almost invariably, people who write on Plato's Timaeus ignore the whole of the last part because it's so full of ancient medical descriptions. You know, how the arteries are connected to the lungs, they're connected to the heart, and how the spleen works, and what happens if your liver goes wrong, and just full of, full of ancient medical stuff like that. One of the commentators said that it's, um, it's almost undigestible to read it. But we'll see. Gregory does the same thing. OK, so let's turn to Gregory. That's just by, by background for what's going on with the structure of the work. Gregory opens his treatise by describing the world as being a dynamic interplay between the various elements all held together in tension. All things, he says, appear in creation are the offspring of rest and motion brought to Genesis in accordance with the divine will. Okay. I'm not going to read through all the quotations they're putting up there. I'm going to refer to them. Some of the longer ones we will go through together and look at what he's saying because they're really provocative. As Gregory makes clear in another work that he wrote about the same time, he regards God's act as being instantaneous, not in time, but it then unfolds in time, in due order and sequence. So having spoken about how everything comes into creation, it's an offspring of rest and motion brought to Genesis by the divine will, he then talks about how heaven and earth were finished, the wealth of all creation, land and sea was ready, but there was no one to share it. Because, he says, the human being has not yet occupied its place in the world. Only having prepared the world as a royal lodging place for a king, does God then present or introduce a human being into the world. Yeah, he, and it's interesting the, the vocabulary he uses. He introduces the human being. He doesn't make the human being. He introduces a human being into the world. And he established him with this twofold origin of formation. Earthly and heavenly. He's blending the earthly with the divine so that we may have enjoyment by means of each. The human being is the only one about, God whom, about whom God takes counsel beforehand. Uh, the, only to the formation of human beings and make of all draw near with circumspection so as to prepare for him beforehand material for his structure and to liken his form to some archetypal beauty, setting before him the goal for which he will come to be. So unlike everything else in creation, the human being has got a goal towards which to come into being, some archetypal beauty, and God approaches a human being with all his due caution, circumspection, and all the rest of it. The goal, Gregory continues, is the exercise of royalty. But it's not the advantage of having a rational soul or free will that constitutes the image, but rather a whole body is shaped for the exercise of royalty. And this gives the human being their distinctiveness. They are living images. They are to um, be manifest themselves through all the virtues that God has in becoming living images of God. Now, certainly in possessing intellect and word, human beings are like the divine. But as God is love, if love is absent, the whole stamp is transformed. He also goes on for uh, many chapters about how the human being in their body is weak. And so the exercise of royalty is rather paradoxical. It's through our weakness that we have to learn to persuade the animals to cooperate with us rather than just ruling over them by brute force. He talks about the form of the body, in particular the fact that human beings are formed upright, standing upright, and that they've got hands. 
Hands, he points out, enable us to have mouths which can form words. So he's going through and praising the body in all these different ways. But then before exploring that further, he then catches himself. He says, well, really, I should have described the, the soul first. And then what he does, it's really striking. He reads the whole of Genesis 1 as being a philosophy of the soul. So I'm going to, I'm going to read this. He says, it seems to me that by these points, Moses reveals a certain doctrine about hidden things and secretly delivers the philosophy concerning the soul, which outside learning, Greek philosophy, also imagined but didn't clearly comprehend. Through these things, the account, Genesis 1, teaches us that the vital and animating power is contemplated in three divisions. One is simply growth and nutrition, supplying what is suitable for the increase of those being nourished, which is called vegetative. So plants have got souls. They've got a vegetative soul. They've got the power of growth and nutrition. For one can, he says, one can perceive in growing plants a certain power of life without a share in sense perception. There is another form of life besides this, which has both that one and adds regulation by sense perception, as is the nature of irrational animals, for not only are they nourished and grow, but they also have the activity of sense perception and apprehension. But the perfect embodied life is seen in the rational, I mean the human nature, which both is nourished and endowed with sense perception and partakes of reason and is oddly endowed by the intellect. He carries on describing that kind of thing. So he says, if therefore scripture says that the human being came into being last after every animated being, the lawgiver is doing nothing other than teaching us matters regarding the soul, seeing that by a certain necessary sequence of order, the perfect comes last. For the others are included in the rational also, while the sense perceptive, so in the sense perceptive, there's also surely the vegetative form, and, in that, and that in turn is only contemplated in material beings. So you've got material beings, animated with vegetable souls, animated with sense perceptive souls, and finally the rational being, which brings all of these up to the level of the perfect. So he concludes, thus reasonably nature makes the ascent, as it were, by steps, and means the properties of life from the lower to the more perfect. So the whole of Genesis 1 is describing the evolution of the soul. Only after going back through this evolution of the soul from the lower forms of life to the more perfect does he return to the fact that we've got hands, go back to the body, and we've got hands, he says, so that we can actually speak as befits a rational soul. He carries on in various ways. He says, since our makers bestowed upon our molded figure a certain godlike grace, by implanting in the image the likeness of his own good gifts, for this reason he gave of his munificence the other good gifts to human nature. But it's not strictly right to say he gave of intellect and practical wisdom, but he gave a share of them, adding to the image the proper adornment of his own nature. It's striking here that the, the image is in fact the bodily form, that which is molded. Yeah? He, gave, he gave upon a molded figure a certain godlike grace by implanting in the image. So the image is that which has been molded, the clay that's been molded. And he's granting to this uh, the likeness of his own goods. But when it comes to intellect and wisdom, it's not that he gave, but he gave a share, meaning that we share in God with these things. But then he carries on that even with this, even with the, you know, the, the, um, the truly superior faculty of intellect, it would be completely incapacitated without the body. So he says, since then the intellect is a thing intelligible and incorporeal, its grace would have been incommunicable and isolated without its movement being manifest by some contrivance. For this reason there was need of this instrumental formation that by touching like a plectrum the vocal organs, it might indicate by the quality of the sounds struck the movement within. So our minds would have been completely incommunicable, akinonitos, if we didn't have sense perception to be able to speak and to be able to receive senses. It's through our, our physical organs that we're able to develop the intellectual faculty. It's totally interdependent upon one another. 
Um, he carries on talking about various aspects relating to soul and body. He speaks about how as long as our mind is oriented towards God, our mind is beautified by God, and in turn, our mind beautifies our body. So there's a kind of a theophanic movement of beauty coming from God through our mind to our body. But if we turn our attention away from God towards our body, well then instead of beautifying our body, our mind instead becomes as shapeless as matter is. Matter in and of itself is shapeless. It will simply push its shapelessness upon that which should be forming it if we're no longer looking at God being formed, forming our body in turn. We've overturned the whole thing, and that is the rise of evil, the genesis of evil, he says. Okay, so that's the first 15 chapters of the work. He's presented us with a wholly positive picture of the human being as the image of God, the culmination of creation, the very reason for creation, the one whose body is structured for the exercise of kingship through weakness, fashioned in such a way even down to the fact of having fingers, that we are able to be rational in our body as well as in our mind. And so become the living image decked out in all the virtues of God. That's the first 15 chapters. But the question is, who is he talking about? Really, who is he talking about? So he then starts chapter 16. And he says, okay, I've got to take up the scriptural verse again. In the scripture, it says that the human being was made in the image and likeness of God. But look around you, and what do you see? What you see are human beings falling sick, suffering, and dying. So how can you possibly say that human beings are in the image of God when what you see is counter to that? Is the evidence of our eyes false, or is scripture lying? Or how do you hold these two things together? And so, he says, I've now got to give a second account, just like Timaeus did. And he does that by going back to the scriptural verse. Let me remind you. So God created man, the human, in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And now he's going to focus on the difference between um, A, uh, A, A, B, in the image of, so God created the human in his own image, and the image God created he him, that. And then verse C, male and female created he them. Because after all, in the prototype, in Christ Jesus, there is neither male nor female. So what's going on with the male and female in Genesis 1, C, and the lack of male and female, as Paul asserts, in Christ, Galatians 3.28, in, in Christ there is neither male nor female, yet Christ is the image of God. So what's, what's going on between these verses? What he's got to say about male and female is really intriguing, perplexing, and the cause of much, much debate, and far too much to get into this afternoon. Yeah, I can talk for another two hours about this, but Irina will be jumping all over me, although I do have my clock here. Okay. More important for us for today with regard to the question of what it is to be human is a specification he makes that the difference between us and God is not really the male and female part. The difference is that... It's a long passage. If the image bears in all points the stamp of its prototypical beauty, if it doesn't have some difference, it'll be exactly the same. It won't be an image, it will be the very same thing. So what is the difference? Well, in fact, it's not being male and female, the last line's here. The difference is that in its very passage from non-being into being is a kind of movement and alteration of the non-existent being changed by the divine purpose into being. So the difference lies in the fact, not the male and female, but that we've come into being, and therefore change and alteration lies at the very basis of our existence. We're always mutable. That's the difference. And it's in terms of this mutability that Gregory will then explain why we don't see the image of God when we look around us, and a whole load of other things. Um, and this is how it relates to uh, Plato's second account in the Timaeus, where he talks about the straying cause. Remember, intellect had to persuade necessity or the straying cause. Well, the straying cause is our inherent mutability and move, movement that's going on in, in through all of this. 
And so in these chapters, what Gregory ends up doing is talking about the overarching economy from Adam to Christ, which leads in the end to that which God has determined from the, from the beginning. And I'm going to come back to that. But most striking for us in, in all of this is that Gregory argues that the statement, God made the human being, does not refer to Adam. When it says God made the human being, it's not talking about Adam. As Gregory points out, Adam doesn't come into the narrative until Genesis 2. Rather, he says, when the account says that God made the human being, all humankind is indicated by the indefinite character of the term. For the creature was not here also called Adam, as the narrative that follows relates. It's in Genesis 2 we meet Adam. But the name given to the created human is not the particular, but the universal. Okay, so the whole of humanity, humankind, is indicated by the indefinite term. The whole of humankind is indicated when it says God made the human being in the image. But as he also points out, when God does anything, it's not indeterminate. It's fixed. It's got a particular shape. And so he says, the entire plenitude. He says, thus we are led by the universal name of the nature to suppose something such as this. That by divine foreknowledge and power, all humanity is included in the first formation. For it's fitting for God not to think of any of the things that had come to be by him as indeterminate. If God does anything, it's not kind of vague and undefined. It's fixed. It's, it's got a particular shape. But that for each being, there should be some limit and measure marked out by the wisdom of God. And carries on. Now, just as any particular human being is encompassed by his bodily dimension, you, if you're thinking about Peter, Paul, James, John, you're thinking about a particular shape of a human being. So... Um, and his magnitude commensurate with the appearance of the body is a measure of his subsistence. So also, I think, the entire plenitude of humanity was included by the God of all, by the power of his foreknowledge, as in one body, and that this is what the account teaches, saying God made the human being in accordance with the image of God made he him. The entire plenitude of humanity constitutes one body that is the one spoken about in Genesis 1.27, God made the human being in his image. And he carries on. The human being manifested together with the first formation of the world, so the one who's spoken about in Genesis 1, and he who shall come to be after the consummation of all, so it's spoken about at the beginning, but it actually comes to be at the end, the one who shall come to be after the consummation of all, both likewise have this. They equally bear in themselves the divine image. For this reason, the whole was called one human being. Because to the power of God, nothing has either passed or is to come, but even that which is looked for is embraced equally with the present by his all-embracing activity. The whole nature then, ex extending from the first to the last, is a kind of single image of he who is. It's a really, really strong understanding of the unity of all human beings. The unity of all human beings, past, present, and future, as the one human being made in the image and likeness of God. And that's bound up with Gregory's idea that God acts instantaneously, but it unfolds in time, through its own sequence and its own order. So in embracing everything that would come to be, the human being manifested at the beginning, and the one who comes to be after the consummation of all, both bear the divine image. And now we can see the significance of the fact that so far Gregory has not been talking about Adam, the first particular human being in the Genesis narrative. He's not been talking about Adam. Adam might be the first, but he's not the Ahi. He might be Protos, but he's not the Ahi. The image of God according to whom God makes a human being is Christ Jesus, we've already seen him called the prototype. But so too is the one who comes to be at the end. 
But then the one who comes to be at the end does so in the entire plenitude of humanity foreseen by Christ, by, by God from the beginning. It's kind of mind-bending stuff. It's put most simply by von Balthasar. He says, the total Christ is none other than the total humanity. The total humanity. And we're not just talking about human nature in the abstract. We're talking about the total pleroma of humanity, the total plenitude of all human beings together as the one human being in the image of God that is Christ. It's really, really fascinating how we can get there and do that. Gregory then carries on this kind of reflection from chapter 16 to 22 with all sorts of details, just like Timaeus does, in a really, again, fascinating way, bringing in the question of male and female and what's going on with all of that. But again, too much for us today. And then he, he answers the question of, well, why doesn't this just happen at the beginning? Why does it take time? And so he says... He says this, with the, with the plenitude of human beings preconceived by the activity of foreknowledge coming into life by means of this more animal form of birth that God makes, but we actually come into existence through sexual procreation, which is the way we end up with the entire plenitude of human beings. With this, God who guides all things in a certain order and sequence since the inclination of our nature to what is lowly, which he who beholds equally with the present what is to be before it happens, made this form of birth absolutely necessary for human humanity. Therefore, also, God therefore also foreknew the time coextensive with the formation of human beings, so that the extent of time should be adapted for the entrance of the predetermined souls, and that the flowing movement of time should then halt when humanity is no longer produced by it. And when the genesis of human beings is completed, time should stop together with the end of it. And then should take place a reconstitution of all, and with the changing of the whole, humanity should also be changed from the corruptible and earthly to the impassable and eternal. Okay? Now, it might seem to us to be a fairly odd idea to think that there's a fixed number of human beings. You know, we've got the idea that you know, time goes on indefinitely, humanity will continue to expand and so on. <clears throat> but what Gregory's doing, he's arguing on an apostolic basis. There will be an end. There absolutely will be an end. The world, the fashion of the world is passing away. There will be an end. And if there's an end, that means there's going to be a fixed number of human beings. And only a fixed number of human beings can have a definite shape. If it's infinite, it's literally got no shape. At Oristos, it's without shape. So, there will be an end. There will come an end to time. There will come an end to procreation. There will come an end to the reproduction of human beings. And then in this entire pleroma of humanity, as we saw, is ultimately the entire Christ. Yeah? And so time, he says, is coexistent with the formation of human beings. Time is coexistent with the formation of human beings. It takes time. Okay. Um, and then this culminates with this uh, reconstitution at the end of all things, the changing of the whole humanity should be changed from the corruptible and earthly to the impassable and heavenly. And what he's talking about there is Paul's words in Corinthians 15. Behold, I tell you a great mystery, we shall all be changed. Yeah? After the whole discussion about death and resurrection, uh, no, the great mystery is, in fact, we shall all be changed. Whether those who are dead or those who are alive, the real mystery is we shall all be changed. And then with this change, we'll meet the Lord in the air, and time will come to an end. Okay. So he says, with, uh, he answers a question. Yeah, I, I just paraphrase through all of that. Uh, won't do that. And so he says, uh, he concludes all of this reflection by saying, be patient, be patient. Let him therefore wait the time necessarily coextensive with the human increase. For even a patriarch with Abraham, while they had desired to see the good things and did not see seeking the heavenly homeland, as the apostle says, yet nevertheless are still in a state of hoping for the grace, God having foreseen something better for us, that without us they would not be made perfect. So they waited, we must wait as well. Time is coextensive with the production of the human being. 
He then goes through all sorts of other chapters, uh, other, other discussions, various different points coming out of this, the nature of matter, the nature of resurrection, a whole load of different things. Um, one particular point of interest to us, and that's the question of what comes first, body and soul? Is it, you know, the, the soul and then the body's made for the soul? And he comes to the conclusion, no, body and soul come into existence together. He says, as a human being is one consisting of soul and body, it is to be supposed that the principle of his constitution is one and, one and common to both. To affirm the whole human plenitude, to have pre-existed in the power of God's foreknowledge, according to the account given earlier, to which, prophecy, the, to which the prophecy bears witness, saying God knows all things before their genesis. Just as we say that in the grain, think about the grain, or in any other seed, the whole form of the corn of ear is potentially included. Leaves, stalk, joints, middle, fruit, beard, everything's included in, in that grain. But for that grain to bear fruit and become all of that, it's got to be put in the earth and die. Okay. Um, and then he carries on and he draws the same analogy with regard to our own constitution, bringing up what we saw before earlier. So he says, just as the body proceeds from a very small original to a perfect state, so also the activity of the soul growing in step with the subject gains and increases with it. For in its first formation, first of all comes a power of growth and nourishment alone, as though some root buried in the ground for the smallness of the one receiving does not emit of more. So what he's thinking is the seed is deposited in the womb. Okay, the seed is deposited in the womb, and in the womb is growing by the power of growth and nutrition, the vegetative level of the soul. Okay? Um, and body and soul grow together in that respect, the vegetative level of soul as a body continues to grow. Then he carries on. Then as a plant comes to light and shows its shoot to the sun, the gift of sense perception uh, flourishes. Blossoms. So when the body and soul have grown to a certain level, comes out of the womb, is given birth into this world of sense perception, and now we start learning by sense perception. Okay. And then when at last it's ripened, it's grown up to its proper height, the rational faculty begins to shine. It takes time for the rational faculty to begin to grow. You know, we come out into the world, our eyes are open, we're attracted by the beauty of the world, but not everything that's beautiful is good. Not everything that appears to be good is good. And so we need to learn. We need to learn through developing that rational faculty. So as a body continues to grow, the rational faculty begins to shine just like some fruit, not all appearing at once, but by diligence growing with the perfection of the instrument, always bearing as much fruit as a power of the subject grants. So the order and sequence that we see through the course of nature, as described in Genesis 1, is recapitulated in the life of each human being, seed deposited in the earth, growing in the womb, growing, coming out into the world, growing, entering up into its full state. Okay. Another image, with this he then turns into the third part of the work. So he's given, in the first 15 chapters, this beautiful description of the human being in the ideal form, Chapter 16 to 29, why don't we see it yet? Well, because of the floundering nature of the human will and because it takes time to reach that pleroma, the multiplication of the human race to reach all of that. But in fact, these two accounts are then placed together like Timaeus did under a single head to describe what actually happens with each and every one of us human beings. We are seed deposited in the womb, we grow in the womb, we come out into the world, we grow into the world, end up dying and rising again. Okay? So he's given two accounts, both of these accounts come under a single head pertaining to each of us as what it is to be a human being. Another image he gives is that of a, of a sculptor. Um, when a sculptor wants to produce a work, uh, the fig of an animal in stone, for instance, what he does is to first separate the stone from the quarry. He then chips away at all the superfluous parts, um, proceeding through to make a basic outline of the statue when somebody might be able to guess, maybe this is a, a lion or maybe it's a whatever else it might be. He then continues to work on it. Um, not that he's... Uh, changing the matter of the stone into the animal, but is imposing a form upon the stone. And then he carries on and says, 
We say, so this is now, this is really the culminating passage of the whole work. We say that the all contriving nature, taking from the kindred matter within herself, the part that comes from the human being, all contriving nature, nature's the active one in this, nature crafts the statue. And just as the form follows upon the gradual work of the stone, at first somewhat indistinct, but more perfect after the completion of the work, so also in the carving of the organism, the form of the soul by the analogy is displayed in the substratum, the form in the matter that's, that's growing, incompletely in that which is incomplete, perfectly in that which is perfect. But it would have been perfect from the beginning had not nature been maimed by evil. And for this reason, our sharing in that impassioned and animal-like genesis brings it about that the divine image does not shine forth immediately in the molded figure, but by a certain method and sequence through those material and more animal-like properties of the soul brings to perfection the human being. It's a really, really striking passage. When he says, um, it would have been perfect from the beginning had nature not been maimed by evil. He's not thinking about later theories of the fall. What he's really thinking about is that we've come into existence, God's brought us into existence, we've been growing in this kind of way, and God has to persuade us to live like Christ. It's not a given that we live like Christ, to be, as we saw earlier, to voluntarily take up the cross, die to yourself and live for another, is virtue that's got to be learned. It can't just be done like that. It's virtue that's got to be learned. So the maiming of evil is really the recalcitrance of our will in wanting to um, respond creatively and positively to the work of God or the all contriving nature in all of this. And for this reason, that last paragraph, the divine image doesn't shine immediately in the molded figure. You don't immediately look at a human being and say, oh, this is the image of God. But through a method and sequence, and it's, it's not by removing yourself from the material and more animal-like property and to become like the angels, but rather it's through the material and more animal-like properties that the human being is brought to perfection, learning strength and weakness, the weakness of the body, and so on. Really, really remarkable. So Gregory's presented us, he then concludes by saying that the exhortation at the end of the work is that um, we must put off the old man and put on the new man to be restored into the, into the one being made in the image of God. So he's given us um, a really remarkable analysis, patterned upon the Timaeus. The first part of the work gives the ideal description of the human being. Chapter 16 to 29 is God's overall economy for the human race as a whole to reach the entire plenitude of humanity that is the image of God. But then both of these fit together into our own life and the pedagogy of our own life to ultimately end up in that through the time which is coextensive with our life to end up um, being formed in the image of God. As such, Maximus, uh, uh, Gregory would actually say, we are, in fact, still embryos. He says, for since the birth pangs of death serve as a midwife assisting the birth of humans to another life, when they go forth to that light and draw on the pure spirit, they know by experience what a great difference is between that life, the life of the resurrection, and this present one. While those who are left behind in this moist and flabby life since they are simply embryos and not humans, they actually only become human in, in the resurrection like that. We are but embryos on the way to that. Because we're simply embryos, we think that the one who's departed is unhappy, as though he were leaving some good. But they don't know that just as for the newborn infant, an eye is open for him when he leaves now what afflicts him. Okay, so just as a newborn infant coming out of the womb now opens their eyes and sees things of sense perception, they thought how beautiful this all is, but actually it's mixed. So also through death and resurrection, our spiritual perception is now finally opened and we will have learned to become not just embryos, but a human being. So he concludes, nature always trains us by death and death has been made to grow together with life as it passes through time. 
Okay. Maximus also talks about the world as being um, a, a, a womb in which we're currently growing and all the rest of it, but I see. I'm going to wrap up now, Irina. I can see the one minute sign. <laughs> okay. okay, so to conclude, um, just a couple of points to conclude. What is really striking for me about these reflections of Gregory and Ignatius before him and others, Irenaeus and others as well, is the way in which the tr for them, the truth about what it is to be human is something that lies in the future. And it's an end towards which we have to give our let it be. Like Ignatius, let me go to my martyrdom. Let me voluntarily take up the cross. Let me die to myself in living, living for others. Okay? We have to give the let it be, and it ultimately comes through death and resurrection. We're but embryos along the way. Also striking is the way this is played out by Gregory, following Irenaeus, is that the pattern of growth which leads to the human being is one that's inscribed within Genesis 1 itself. Matter, plants, animals, the human being in the image. That pattern of growth. It's inscribed within the economy which leads from Adam to Christ and from being male and female to being human, where the body of Christ is in fact the entire pleroma of human beings. And then it's also recapitulated in the life of each human being, from the seed deposited in the womb, born into the world of sense perception, learning through death in this world of sense perception, to be born into life as a human being through death. In fact, one might say that the real focus of Gregory's tripartite treaties, just like the Timaeus, is the third part, the actual empirical formation and development of the human being in the way that he was describing it with the medical terminology of his day, for which the first two parts of the work provide the, if you like, the teleological and the material causalities at work. Yet there's perhaps something in the idea that the lifespan of the in human individual finding its completion at the end recapitulates the lifespan of the human race as traced by evolutionary biology and psychology. Starting with you know, learning to walk, then learning to talk, then you know, the, the, the growth trajectory of, of humankind through history is recapitulated in the lifespan of each human being. Okay. Also striking is the necessity for time in all of this. Time is coextensive with the making of the human being, either collectively, the arc of the economy of the world as a whole, or individually, recapitulated in our own, each of our lives, the time of our life. And then finally, and perhaps the most striking point in all of this material, is that the distinctiveness of what it is to be human is not spelled out in terms of the possession of the intellect or free will or a particular bodily form. Although these all play a part, obviously, it's not reduced to anything like that as it so often is in pop theology. Rather, the distinctiveness of the human being is in the transformation to which we are called through death. We are not yet human. We become human in that final mystery, as Paul says. Behold, I tell you a great mystery. We shall all be changed. We shall all finally become human. So as Dostoevsky put it, my final sentence, we are clearly transitory beings. And our existence upon earth is clearly a process. A process, the uninterrupted existence of a chrysalis transitioning into a butterfly. Okay, thank you. So, um, we have no time, but maybe <laughs> there are some really urgent questions that uh, uh, you would like to ask Father John. Um, or not. Uh, I just uh, wanted to clarify. So, um, 
to put it simply, so if traditional understanding of the end of the world is that things could, that things go like really bad, so in your view the end would come and things actually, not in your view, in Gregory of Nyssa when this pleroma of humanity will actually reach to yeah. certain uh, perfection. So, so, so you, you have to remember, absolutely everything that comes into being passes away. It's just a basic law, genesis and corruption, genesis and thought. No, no, I, I'm every, collective. Every, everything that comes into being passes away. The distinctiveness of the Christian proclamation is that that passing away is a transition into um, eternal immortality. Yeah? Pascha, Passover, passage, the very, you know, the very act of Christ dying is what brings about life. Okay? So, Everything that comes into being passes away. What we thought was the end actually now becomes the beginning. The beginning of that which God has intended from the beginning. And so only here do we finally become a human being. Now, that happens individually. We all come into existence with no choice and are thrown into existence which whatever we do, we're going to die. It sucks. Yeah? But because of Christ and his passion, that end now becomes a birth into life, which we anticipate. Taking up the cross, baptism, living, all of that. We anticipate voluntarily our death, changing the modality of that death from being us being passive victims to us being active within this. We voluntarily take up the cross to die to myself, to live for others, to enter into a mode of life which can't be touched by death because I've entered into it through death. So it happens individually, but it's going to happen collectively. The world will come to an end. No doubt about it. We may be closer to it than we were before, but everything that's coming to being will pass away. No doubt about it. But that passage away, passing away, is also the transformation of all things into a situation where God will be all in all. No doubt about it. Yeah? Now, if there's going to be an end, well, that also means that there will be an end to human reproduction. Yeah? You know, <laughs> whether it's, I don't know, global warming, whether it's a meteor hitting the earth, whether it's whatever it is, there will be an end to all of this, and that will put an end to all of that. If there's an end to all of that, then there will be a fixed number. It's inconceivable for, for the Greek fathers to think of it being indefinite. Because if it's indefinite, it's vague. It's got no shape. And so how can God make something which is indefinite? Yeah? It's going to, God's going to make something that's going to have a definite form. And so the, the, the end of the world, end of procreation, fixing with that final number, that is the entire pleroma, plenitude of humanity in all its particulars. But what he's also saying is that the time that it takes us to get there, however long that might be, is coextensive with the production of the human being. The human being, which is the one human being in all these particulars, together as the one body, the total humanity is the total Christ. It's really, really remarkable treatise. Now, whether he's right, that's a whole other question. <laughs> but I've done my best to try and present what Gregory is saying in this work. But the possibility of humanity destroying itself is still possible. Oh, absolutely. One, as I said, one way or the other, the world will come to an end. No doubt about it. But so the, no, the humanity but, will not have to be perfect to do that. But, but there's no point. Obviously, we've got to do what we can do not to hasten it. You know, we've got to I know, reduce carbon. We've got to work for those who are suffering as a result of all of this. But don't think that by doing that, we're going to stabilize the world. Everything that comes into being will pass away. But it's in this very passage that Christ has turned death into life. Right, so, um, okay, one more. Well, I think Father Stephen, just a second. Um. Um, forgive me if this is an ignorant remark, but it may connect to something that you were just discussing. 
from several of the texts which you quote, one might be forgiven for thinking that Gregory understands things in terms of the pre-existence of souls. No, he, he does, he's very, very specific about that. Absolutely not. I, I don't think, or, or, as far as I can see, Origen didn't teach that as well. And Gregory certainly doesn't. Well, I'm not sure that the text bears true to that. You, you can see what it says. It, he says, according to the account that we gave earlier. So remember, God is outside of time. There's no before or after. So all things are present to him. What to us is past, present, and future is all in the present for him. But presence with him doesn't imply prior chronology for us. But it might imply a prior um, uh, determination of numbers of beings in the same way that your logic would suggest that uh, ultimate consummation of everything has a determined end. Well, there is a determinant end because there will be an end in which, Christ, which all things be brought into subjection to Christ and Christ will subject all to God and God will be all in all. It's basic Corinthians 15, 28. Mm. There is that in the apostolic proclamation. Now, with regard to pre-existence of this, that, and the other, you have to be really, really careful when you're talking about God in whom there is no before or after. So those who are yet to come for us, you know, generations of children and great-grandchildren, whatever else it might be, who are yet to come, are already present with him. Because there's no past, present, or future. For him, for us there is, but not for him. Pardon? No, they do not. You know, my grandchild does not yet exist in the space time of this world, at least as far as my children have told me. Yeah. But with God, there is no past, present, or future. All things, even the future, are present to Him. In God, but not within space time yet. But that's not prior chronology. Existence in God is not prior chronology within the space time of this world. I, I suggest that we bring these discussions into the uh, coffee um, time and continue with our next speaker. But let's thank Father John for this <laughs> profound paper.